Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry, a John Carpenter fancast. My name is Alex. Uh, with me are my co-hosts, Noel and Julia. Say hello. Hello. And our very special guest, Maida Fail's own Kevin O'Shea. Currently working through the death blogs right now, so I apologize if my voice sounds less voicey than it usually does. <laughs> No apologies needed. It's going to be that kind of podcast. We are all a little distant from the actual watching of it, so yeah. we're all going to be a little punchy. It's going to be great. I mean, we were going to do this last week, but Kevin was in the early stages of the Death Blarg. I was at the point that he's at now in my own Death Blarg. Incidentally, do you remember where I picked up the term Death Blarg? I thought it was from our group of people and possibly Cleo. I just remember Cleo being one of the ones who uses it all the She's time. She's probably who I got it from. Because I've been saying it from now on, and once you take over somebody's thing for a while, you kind of forget where you grabbed it from. So I wanted to make yeah. sure that that was not lost. Well, mine is probably actually con crud, because I actually did catch it at a con two weeks ago. But yeah. <laughs> oh, mine's um, retirement home rehab facility, probably. So it is Death Blark. It, it is the Death Blark, I guess. To say sensitively. <laughs> yes. But yeah, we were going to record last week, and we had all watched the movie. Except me, I actually managed to save one hour. But we had all, like, watched it in prep for recording last week, and we decided at the last minute to reschedule. So memories, for the bulk of us, the memory of, of this thing that we watched is about a week distant. Memories! <laughs> I couldn't let that slide, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I will also warn people that my sister's 29th birthday party with 30 people is happening upstairs as we speak. So if there's any, like, background noise on my end, that would be why. All right. I'm right underneath the table full of make-your-own-taco material that everyone's gathered around. <laughs> so yes, we are here to discuss Elvis. That is correct. What's important about Elvis is it was the first of five movies, though this one was actually a TV miniseries, but still, it's the first of five projects that John Carpenter collaborated on with actor Kurt Russell, and that's why we wanted to have Kevin essentially be our Kurt Russell and just join us for those projects, because I know Kevin was really excited about this podcast when we first pitched it. And Wait, we were supposed we... to watch the one with Kurt Russell? I watched the one with Bruce Campbell. <laughs> okay, Kevin was previously joining us on this episode, but he had to leave suddenly. <laughs> this episode has been canceled. All right. <laughs> so yeah, he was very excited about this podcast when I first pitched it to him, and so we wanted to get him on in some capacity, and this felt like the right way. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm very glad that you grabbed me for this. Even though once we do, like, Big Trouble in Little China, it's like another 10 years before they make their last film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it'll be some gaps. For sure. We might sneak him into a few other non-Kurt Russell ones, just the ones that were kind of Russellish in spirit. Oh, yes. The uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper as Kurt oh, Russell yeah. as. <laughs> the uh, Kurt Russell-esque. The Russellosity was almost Russell-tastic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then Ghost of Mars, where Natasha Henstridge was playing Kurt Russell. I have not seen that in so long. I'm very excited to watch that one again, I think. <laughs> so anyways, the 1979 Elvis movie was a Dick Clark production. Oh, wow. Naturally. John Carpenter came into it entirely as a director for hire, so he didn't have any of his usual crew with him. It was a lot like someone's watching me. He just mm. had a lot of ABC TV vets surrounding him. However, a lot, a lot of the crew actually then ended up going on to do things with him later. Cinematographer Donald M. Morgan would do Christine and Starman, makeup artist Marvin G. Westmore return years later on Escape from L.A. Oscar-winning sound mixer Willie D. Burton would come back for Ghosts of Mars. First assistant director Larry Franco would continue in that role on The Fog, Escape from New York, The Thing, Christine, Starman, Big Trouble in Little China, Prince of Darkness, and They Live, and also co-produced every single one of those after The Fog. And he's since gone on to produce or executive produce several Tim Burton films, Rocketeer, Jumanji, Hulk, Batman Begins, and Roland Emmerich's last three films. At the time of this film, Larry Franco was married to Jill Russell, Kurt Russell's sister. And I should also point out that Bing Russell, Kurt Russell's real-life dad, plays Elvis's dad in the movie. And Susan Hubley, who plays Priscilla, would marry Kurt by the end of the year and also appears in Escape from New York before they divorced in 1983. 
And otherwise, the only other familiar face we got to point out is our good friend Charles Cyphers. This is the fourth time we've seen him, and he plays Sam Phillips, the first record producer of Elvis. Charles Cyphers, I'm just coming to really enjoy every time he pops up in these. I've already forgotten who he is. <laughs> Which he other characters Sheriff he Lee Brackett. He was the cop and someone's watching me. Okay, okay. He was the marshal in, uh, in Assault on Precinct 13. Yeah, he's one of those background guys who never really is a star. Mm-hmm. But he's just one of those small background actors that Carpenter would keep using. And we've only got three more films before they stopped working together for some reason. So otherwise, I don't have anyone else to point out among the names. And I have no desire to synopsize this movie. It's impossible. <laughs> it's the life of Elvis Presley. It's a biopic. Exactly. Yeah, it's the Wikipedia page of Elvis Presley. <laughs> it's one of those biopics where it's like everything. Every yeah. single moment in his life from childhood to when he was about to launch his comeback career in, in the late 60s. Everything is in there. Mm -hmm. Sidebar. Mm -hmm. Maybe you guys can finally lay this to rest with me. I've been pronouncing it my entire life as biopic. Is that wrong? It's biopic. It's okay. biopic? I say biopic as well. I say biopic. Yeah, do you? Yeah. I know it's supposed to be read as biopic. Well, it was meant to be two words, biopic, a biographical picture. Oh, I'm sure it's right. There's so many things that I read all the time that I mispronounce uh, to this day. What's the one that I do all the time? Oh, I can't remember. Yeah. It's ethereal, right? Erythral. You say erythral. Erythral. <laughs> <laughs> I used to say cacophony. <laughs> yeah. I think urethral means it's inserted in the urinary tract. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. It's kind of an ethereal thing. <laughs> I don't think that biopic or, or biopic is one of those ones that anyone's really going to pick a fight over. Not really. Like animated pictures on the internet. Okay, because biopic just sounds a lot more natural, you know? It does. But I mean, bio, it was originally like bio hyphen pick. The latest yeah. biopic from... <laughs> what is this person's bio? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> but yeah, biopics are kind of hard to synopsize because you're not going to watch them as movies. They're basically like fanciful documentaries. Exactly. Documentaries with artistic license. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think, why don't we just jump ahead, since we're starting to slip into some discussion here, why don't we just go ahead and jump into, do you recommend this film or not? And Alex, I think we'll start with you. Oh, I'm on the spot. Um, well, you're I'm always gonna... the one that we do first. Oh, am I? <laughs> <laughs> you are. <laughs> I do have the worst memory of all time, by the way. Just, just. Uh... No, I have the worst memory. Do you? Okay. We've all only right. been doing this for almost a year. It's yes. true. <laughs> I don't recommend this. I found it to be a Cliff Notes version of the life of Elvis Presley. I did not find much John Carpenter in this particular John Carpenter film. I found it to be a rare miss. I did not hate it by any stretch of the imagination, but I did find my attention wandering frequently, especially when I was looking up on Wikipedia to see if some of these things were true that they were discussing or showing in the movie. I just found it was a collection of scenes that really... Didn't do much for me. Didn't really have a cohesive, like, narrative. Julia? I also do not recommend it. I would say that I, speaking of the Wikipedia page, enjoyed the Wikipedia page more than the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and got more out of it, really. Though there was some touches and some certain scenes that I actually really enjoyed about it, as a whole, I found it a really big slog. It was work to have to sit through it. And my attention definitely wandered throughout it. Kevin? This is going to be slightly complicated as a movie. No, absolutely do not recommend this as a fanciful documentary that if you're just sitting around and you want to plop on some documentaries on Netflix, which everybody gets those moods every once in a while. That's why they have them on Netflix. It's a good time waster and it's good music if you like Elvis music. So it's like, yeah, have it on in the background. But as far as watching it to watch it, not really, no. And I got a, I didn't really expect that we were all going to not recommend it, but yeah, I'm not recommending it either. I do see a lot of Carpenter just in the way the film is shot. The film looks great. Oh, absolutely. It just has this really nice, crisp, sharp look that Carpenter's always been known for. It's beautifully lit, beautifully shot. But I mean, there's no pace to it. There's no structure to it. There's no depth to it. It's literally just moment, 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 song. And moment, 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 song. It doesn't even use the song as like a montage bass. It just pause and watch a song for three minutes. And then moment, 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 song. The performances are kind of uneven, but I mostly blame that on the script. It just, the dialogue is just really clunky and hammy. And I think the problem was the guy who wrote the film is also the guy who produced the film. So you can imagine that John Carpenter didn't really have any freedom to really change anything. Mm -hmm. So he just, you know, he took an assignment. And he just directed it as capably as he could with the material he was given and the crew he was given. 
and then just turned out the final product. And I think for his part, it's capably made, but it's still not a good film overall. There's some threads in here I like, but I'll get to them in discussion. It's just not, it's boring. <laughs> it is boring. And it was a big success too, apparently. Oh, it was a huge hit. Well, you know, people like Elvis. They do. But you notice it was a huge hit at first. And then you don't really see many stories of people continuing to talk about it over the years. No, it's not like a beloved favorite or a fan favorite. It was like a television event type thing? Yeah, yeah. television event. Yeah, even now you ask people a lot of like, wait a minute, Kurt Russell was in a movie about Elvis? <laughs> Which was my reaction when you told me yeah. about it. Me too. I mean, my biggest problem is it has that Peacekeeper Wars effect of too much story for too little running time. That is timely and on-point reference. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well done. And it's just, there's no focus. No. And because they don't focus on anything, nothing gets developed. So it's just literally a collection of moments. It's, it's exactly what you said. It was point to point to point to song, point to yep. point to point to song. Yeah. And it's it's interesting that you said the uh, cinematography is very John Carpenter as far as, you know, camera angles, all of that. That's stuff that I was noticing, too. But it kind of fell by the wayside as there was nothing really to... There was no meat underneath the images. Yeah, or for it to segue into. Yeah. It seemed almost afraid to get into Elvis's character. Like, it seemed like he was wearing the Elvis costume and he was doing an all right job, although it's really hard to do an Elvis performance without it sounding like an Elvis impression. But it, to me, he was not... I don't know who Elvis was at the beginning, yeah. and I don't know who Elvis was at the end. And again, it like throws a lot of things in there, like the whole conflict over being separated from his dead twin, mm -hmm. the relationship with Red, which I thought would have made an interesting film in its own right had they focused on it. Mm -hmm. Just him like sinking into despair and loneliness. We just get glimpses of it. We never focus on any of it. And I should point out, the guy who wrote and produced this... He also wrote a number of those really shitty Elvis movies <laughs> in the 60s. Like, you know, there's that scene where Elvis is on the beach shooting the movie and gets into an argument with the director about how I'm sure there's some good lines in this script if I ever read it. <laughs> this is the guy who wrote the script that they're making fun of. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It's typical TV act writing, and it's just, it's not good. I would have liked to have seen this in the hands of someone gifted who had, had enough writing talent to match John Carpenter, but it's just bad. I would have chopped up any portion of Elvis's life and made a separate movie, like Elvis being afraid to leave his house. That would have been a great movie. It's like they took Elvis the TV series, and this is the compilation version. Yeah, it's like a collection of scenes for the home video market. <laughs> Or use them all as better framing devices for the songs, because that's the other reason that people will be watching this is because, you know, they're a fan of the music. Let's do more about, you know, the behind the scenes of the songs themselves and yeah. use the stories of his life as a framing device to do that. It's basically, you know, there's like three different directions that the script is going in, and it only touches upon each of those directions instead of going all the way to one and glossing over the other two, which would have been a stronger script. You know, what's interesting is despite the impact that this had on Carpenter's career and that it was a big success for him and introduced him to Kurt Russell, he doesn't talk about this film very much. I mean, like someone's watching me where he didn't have complete creative control. He still loves the film and talks about it all the time. He never talks about this movie at all. It doesn't feel like a loved movie. Well, do you really think any of us are going to talk about it after we have to talk about it? It's true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a film that, you know, he did as a job. And then he moved on. Yeah, it was a paycheck. And then once he cashed it, he was done. And nothing wrong with that. He used this money and he made the fog. <laughs> yeah. This is the movie he had to make to make the next one. Exactly. Yeah. And that's okay. <laughs> yeah. And we're about to hit the fog and then escape from New York. So I mean, oh, it's man. like he is gearing up to yeah. really take off on his own. We are in for, yeah, we're getting into the good stuff right after this. Like I, the rest of it's been oh, good. We still got one more right after this. We still got one more. Little oh, right. right after but this. I'm excited about that one too. That premise yeah. is great. Yeah. We're about to head into the point here where he's done assault and he's done Halloween and he's already caught people's attention. And now he's gearing up the resources to really start running with it. 80s Carpenter. Oh, man, it's going to be great. But I mean, this one is just, yeah, it was, he took a gig. Yep. It seems like it. I mean, he basically directed this one in the way he wrote Zuma Beach. Mm. He gave it his all, but there wasn't much to it. No, it's true. Just a bunch of re-recorded Elvis songs. Yeah. Which leads me to an interesting question. Was that Kurt Russell singing or was that a, a, like... No. Oh. It's a country singer. Right. Country singer and Elvis impersonator who, yeah, and very visibly dubbed. Yeah. <laughs> I kept getting top secret flashbacks. <laughs> <laughs> nice reference. Kurt Russell, 
I like him better in the second half as he gets into older Elvis than I do the younger Elvis. Mm -hmm. Then it just seems like he's really, it's more of an impression than a performance. He's being Mm -hmm. less James Deany and more what he wants to be. Exactly. I was definitely getting a James Deany kind of vibe from it. Yeah, he's trying a little too hard with the lips and the accent and all that. Yeah, a lot of the things was him trying to do the quaff. And I'm like, did he dress like that in high school? Did Elvis come fully formed like that? With the quaff, with the fancy clothes, with the sneer, with the draw. He just popped out from between Shelly Winters' legs with that hair. (laughs) No wonder Shelly Winters was so befuddled. That's true. (laughs) She was not having a good time in that movie. She seemed like she was out of it. (laughs) Well, fit the character. I guess so, yeah. Again, bad dialogue. Yeah, it was not good dialogue. But I mean, I liked him better when he got into older Elvis and he got to get into the meat of, you know, the paranoia, the loneliness, just not knowing where he wants to go anymore. That's when he really started bringing some really good performance. Mm -hmm. It was hard to distinguish the two Elvises, though, because I guess he just refused to put on old man makeup or... Like, Elvis got bigger as he got older, but Kurt Russell does not do any of that. Not yet by this point. By the point where we leave him right there around 1969, 1970, he still looked pretty good. Did he? That was the beginning of his comeback, yeah. Yeah, and then it was during this comeback that that's when he hit the drugs and booze hard and really started putting on weight. This is the beginning of the end. I do like that last poignant note where it's like holding on him doing the pose and then pushing it on his face, showing the life. I mean, it's a typical like melodramatic soap opera thing, but it worked. It's the point where Dennis Leary always said to end Elvis on. Yeah. And I love how it doesn't show his entire life falling apart, but it shows you that he's on that path. It's like the aviator doesn't get to the part where he's peeing in jars. It just gets up to the point where you know he's going to be peeing in jars. Yes, exactly. Yes, Elvis has not yet started peeing in jars. Not yet. (laughs) They had that whole thread about with the dead twins so that he always feels like half of a complete person and he doesn't know whatever happened to the other half. It's like they set that up early on and then you occasionally hear mention of it. And then like later on, you just get these scenes where he starts talking to his own shadow. Mm -hmm. And it's like this would be so much more poignant if it were better written and if they had actually built it in as a recurring image and theme. Yeah, a much more interesting shot would have been required for me as well, because it was just so blatant that that's what's going on, where it just feels silly. I think the shot is fine. It's what was said. Yeah. It wasn't enough. Yeah, again, it's the dialogue. It's just bad dialogue. (laughs) (laughs) Because I think it's kind of quirky and and neat to have a conversation with the idea of your other self, your Mm. alter self. It's blatantly obvious, but it would depend what your alter self had to say. And it That's turns true. out, not much. <laughs> I would just like to see it either built in as a kind of recurring thing, like maybe use it as like a framing device as, as the multi-part miniseries of just, he shares these moments with his own shadow. Mm-hmm. Or just have it be like the entire film is narrated by Elvis, and then at the end we realize he's just talking to his own shadow on the wall. That'd be kind of cool, yeah. I think maybe, like you were saying with the dialogue, maybe he just comes across as too simplistic most of the time, where he's just yeah. like, I miss my kid, Jesse Guerin. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> I love the idea of the only person he fully connects with is a shadow of someone who's never been there. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. But again, that, that like needs its own story. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I, I like the character of Red, his best friend. That is, again, that kind of bromance between them. I would have liked to have just seen that film. That would have been a good movie. Because those are my favorite parts of the series. Yeah. Well, I think the part that's so frustrating is that there is a hundred fantastic stories in the life of Elvis. He's a fascinating and messed up man yeah. who had an incredible life yeah. and they created nothing out of it. Yeah. Just exactly. a series of events. Just a series of, and then this happened and then this happened and then this they happened. They tried to touch on everything. And then dropping out like all yeah. the juicy bits too, you yeah. know, where they're like, oh, there's Priscilla that we won't discuss that she's a child yeah. and yeah. that, you know, crossing across borders and making deals with the parents and forcing her to stay in the house and like all of that's really good meaty stuff, right? Yeah. Priscilla was actually involved and consulted on this. So that's probably why they glossed over her being 14 when they Yeah. Met. Yeah. <laughs> Alex said they paid her like something ridiculous sum for her There's like $10,000 just to read the script. Yeah. And she was like, mm, I think we're going to cut this <laughs> and this. <laughs> they had all those points and they tried to touch upon everything and yeah. ended up as like baskets too full of crap. <laughs> Again, let me pitch Elvis the TV series. I think we got five seasons here. At least. (laughs) NBC's Elvis. There are moments that I love in this, and partially it's just because of how well Carpenter directed them, but one of my favorite moments, even though it comes out of nowhere and it leads to nothing, there's the great moment where he's just staring at the living room full of people who are supposed to be his friends, and he's just sitting there fiddling with the airplane, and then cut to just outside as he's trying to get this toy airplane to start, 
and everyone's just grouped around him watching him. And he stands up, pulls out a cigarette, and everybody pulls out a lighter. That was Julia's favorite scene, too. That was my favorite part of the whole movie. <laughs> that was a good scene. My favorite part is when he walks into the room, and they're all watching television and doing their own thing. But as soon as he just leans in the doorway, everyone stops, turns around, and stares and waits for him to decide what they're going to do. Yep. The entourage. <laughs> I like that whole entourage of just this group of friends that are on his payroll. So it's like you don't really entirely know where everyone stands. And then when you even accuse them of just being there for the money, it's like, no, they're actually hurt because they are his friends. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But they aren't really his friends because friends are your friends is give and take. You know, you can't yeah. rule your life around one other person. Therefore, it's an uneven relationship. The same as like he can't oh, do yeah. anything without it being all about him. You know, yeah. sometimes you just want to see how an airplane works. You don't need it's 20 true. people standing around watching you do it. But they get Cadillacs out of the deal. Well, uh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do like the one moment, though, of the guy like refusing to accept it at first. Oh, the, the refusing to accept the yeah, car. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You're not going to turn down a Cadillac for long. But then I also love the moment where then it's like cut to them all in the living room rehearsing for the upcoming show. And it's like you see that these are all people who do work together and do actually contribute. They are his band. Yeah. I like that, too, because I'd like to see something about the actual music because yeah. it was just like, I'm just going to sing You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog. And yeah. there's the song. I'm there like, was no like, how did the song get made? Where did they uh, Where did the come ideas from? come from? How did you create the chorus? And a lot of these weren't even his songs. They were just songs of the era. Just being covered by it. His Elvis. first hit was sung by a different guy, and, exactly. and that guy died poor, and Elvis died rich. It's yeah. just one of those things. That was one of the interesting things, is, is they briefly touch on it, is that whole accusation that Elvis basically stole the music of black culture of the time. Oh, he did, but yeah. And Well, but yes and no, I mean... Well, he didn't, but his producer did. <laughs> no, I know, exactly. He didn't because that is legitimately the culture he grew up in. Mm -hmm. He grew up among those people gospel. and went to those churches yeah. with the gospel choirs. Yeah. That was his culture, but the producers took advantage of it and used him as a way to appropriate that music for a white audience. There's a quote about how you could sell this to a mass audience with a yeah. white face. And it's like, I like the movie when it gets into these interesting ideas but then it's like right by the time they hook you with them, they've moved off to another scene. It's true, because if you keep following that thread, it's going to get uncomfortable pretty quick. <laughs> but it's like a train that doesn't stop. Yeah. And it's like you're passing by all these fantastic places where you want to get off and explore them, but you just have to keep moving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and it's like when we're in Germany, and it's like, you know, the people are going up to him, hey, sing for us, Elvis, sing for us. And he goes to the black guy sitting at the table and says, I'll go up there if you go up there too. And the black guy goes up there and plays the piano with him. And it's like, I want to see that relationship. I want to know who this person is. Mm -hmm. I want to know how that ties into this whole theme. Absolutely. You never get it. They just go up, sing Tutti Frutti, and, which again was a Little Richard song. Yep. <laughs> and then we move on. I want to see a My Dinner with Elvis. And he's macking on with a 14-year-old. <laughs> yeah, he sure was. He liked young girls. Oh, Elvis. And then Natalie Wood, that entire relationship was just a cameo. She's in like one scene. It's that scene where it's like him and his friends all go to the arcade that they rented out, but then the media crashes in. It's like, is that Natalie Wood? Oh, I see. And then he just like shoves a guy and walks out. Yeah. Very Cliff's Notes, this movie. Yeah. It's just the Reader's Digest. And I knew it was going to be that way, too, when it opened with him shooting the television. And I'm like, oh, there's Elvis shooting the television. I wonder if this is going to be a series of moments that I know. And it was. Again, beautiful John Carpenter shot. Yeah. yeah the television sure. exploding, but yeah. <laughs> Carpenter can't fix this. And I don't think he was interested in fixing it. He was just interested in doing it as capably as he could. Yeah. I mean, it's like Zuma Beach. He had no interest in writing Zuma Beach, but he mm -hmm. wrote it as capably as he could. And he collected his paycheck and used that to make the films he wanted to. And Zuma Beach was awesome. <laughs> and Zuma I Beach really was still Zuma awesome. Beach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, and then again, that's because it was the foundation that he yeah. built that was interesting, even though it wasn't directed. All that interesting, this one shows how important having that foundation of a good script is. It's true. This one has just had a horrible script, and he directed it wonderfully, mm. but there's nothing you can do to fix that. Every biopic involving a musician seems to be the same. It always starts with their most famous concert, like this, or like Walk the Line starts with the Folsom Prison concert. Then you go through their entire life from beginning, middle to end, and then back to the concert. And then it's like, I can't hear that song from Ghost anymore without just picturing two shirtless people starting to make pottery. <laughs> and you don't mind that? And they sang it twice. <laughs> they sang it twice. Yeah. <laughs> I hunger for your child. <laughs> I don't really know what else to say about this movie because it's just, it's kind of there. Like I said, if you're bored at home and you want to put on a documentary on Netflix to have as the background, 
just as yeah. background music and sound and something going on, this is the thing to choose for it. Yeah. It involves no thought and no real emotional investment. Like, I was trying to get emotionally invested in it, and I kept tabbing away to see what was on my computer, and yeah. then going back, and I didn't miss anything. Yeah, and the reason I didn't catch the last hour last time was because I took a break every half hour. Yeah, it's a bit of a chore. Yeah. <laughs> it's not something that I would go see in the theaters. It's not something I would watch specifically to watch, except for this time. And that's our first 15-minute episode, so good night, everybody. <laughs> yeah, see you later. <laughs> but now, I mean, seriously, it's like I don't really have... There's so much here, but there's nothing to any of it. All my notes looking through it, even if we did this directly after watching it and we watched it in one sitting, I have notes that say, like, what's going on? <laughs> Is she dying? I think they're setting her up dying. Oh, she died. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shelly Winters, it was a hammy performance, but it was still mm. enjoyable. I mean, it was Shelly Winters. Uh, yeah, she was bringing it in, like, the Poseidon adventure, but, like, this, it seems like she's, I don't know. I think she was really phoning it in here. Yeah. I like the whole thing of how he still has this kind of childlike attachment to his mother, and he's very much still kind of a regressed kid at times. Oh, yeah. That's, uh... No, it yeah. got weird. Yeah. I, I know it was weird, but I kind of liked it just because that was at least... Every time that would come up, those are those moments where it, like, suddenly is interesting, at least. Yeah, yeah that's where, true. To see where they'd actually go with it. Where, again, I would like to see someone actually build something with those threads. A movie about him and his mother instead of just the whole life. And then, yeah, when he when he's with Priscilla, and it's like, your hair looks just like my mama's. Yeah, which is what every woman wants to hear. <laughs> yeah. I like how everyone's kind of subconsciously doing the drawl. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't know at all. <laughs> Somewhere on my lip here. Yeah. <laughs> all some crazy blues. And then, you know, Bing Russell, I thought, was just nice as the dad. And that is Kurt Russell's actual dad. Which is cool. I love that his name is Bing. <laughs> I always thought that happens. What is Bing short for? Is that Bingover. an actual name? It might actually just be Bing, because, you know, Bing Crosby was popular there back yeah, in the day this guy yeah. was a kid. Hang on, you know, Bing I have name? somebody who can answer that, if you want. <gasps> yes, absolutely. Yes, ask, ask. Hey, Laura, hmm. Bing, as the first name, is that a diminutive for anything, or is it just Bing? It's just Bing. It was one of those types of decades. It's just Bing. Like a biff or a buzz? Yeah. I kind of love it. Thank you. Thank you very much. My at-home, in-pocket name expert. Looking go. him up, he did have a few early credits under the name Neil Russell, so that might just be a stage name. Maybe, yeah. Oh, no. I would like to believe <laughs> he's a Bing. Maybe he's a Bing Crosby fan. Neil, Neil, Orange Peel. <laughs> what? <laughs> Bing's the way to go. Yep. Yeah. Stick with Bing. He'll be a star. <laughs> I liked Pat Hingle, the old Commissioner Gordon, showing up as the colonel, the record producer. That was, the, I think, the youngest I've seen him, yeah. I think this was the first thing I ever saw in him where I realized he only has nine fingers. Are you serious? Yeah, I, I noticed it's like, he looks like he's holding that cigar weird. He has no pinky on one of, on his left hand. Very interesting. I never noticed. It's like James Doohan, uh, Scotty. Yeah. I didn't realize until recently that he was missing a finger, too. And it's like, now you always look for it. Whoa, you're blowing my mind. <laughs> were these guys heavy gamblers? Maybe they were. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything else to say. Well, I think something must be because it was a made-for-television miniseries. It had to be watered down so that it could be appealed to a mass audience. If you were to get yeah. too deep into any part mm. of Elvis's life, you would realize he was a jerk who was crazy. Yeah. Like, yeah. there's so much <laughs> rocky ground there where Elvis fans are watching this. Yeah, so and they, they want to see what see, they know. Yeah, they want to yeah. see the things they know. They want to see happy, light things. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily want you to change reality and the fact yeah. that he married a child or, you know, the passing of his mother or any of that kind of stuff or the fact that he went a little nuts always at the end. But it's like anything that actually had weight to it or that was interesting yeah. to explore kind of glossed over it because it's not going to appeal to a mass market. There was enough drama to appeal to, like, looky-loos who want to see a little bit of the yeah. dirt, yeah. No, yeah, you can see, like, the typical mainstream audience looking for something to watch on a Sunday night mm -hmm. as a family. You know, Elvis was still a big thing in the news then. When did he pass away? 77, I want to say. So, I mean, it was still, I mean, this would have been news, the making of this would have been news as everyone was like, oh, they're making that Elvis story now, you know, because he just died. Now we can know him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, no, the inside scoop. And did you hear they paid Priscilla a lot of money? That's true. Yeah. TMZ before TMZ. <laughs> <laughs> he was a jerk who was crazy, I think is probably the best synopsis I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> and probably, I don't think we can top that. Change the gravestone. Yep. <laughs> Elvis Presley, here lies a jerk who was crazy. <laughs> and this had the whole Michael Jackson quality if he never grew up. Or at least yeah. as he's presented here. Yeah. Well, why do you think Michael Jackson idolized him so much? 
That's true. John Carpenter's Michael Jackson. Oh, I'd see that. I'd watch that. Yeah. Wait, didn't we just watch that, though? We did. Is yeah, No, but- we watched him direct a movie that someone else wrote about Michael Jackson in a made-for-television series. <laughs> But imagine how beautifully lit the John Carpenter tracking shot on that moonwalk would be. Oh, yeah. That would have been a thing of beauty. We still got time, guys. Yeah. Let's write some emails. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking about that. Like, who would we get to play John Carpenter's Michael Jackson? I couldn't even imagine. <laughs> oh, wow. Like, well, because now you have to find someone trans- The transformation yeah. would have to be remarkable. Well, following Kurt Russell here, who's a Disney tween star who's in their 20s? Uh, let's get Bruno Mars. <laughs> Could we get that kid who was the brother of the Sister Sister Girls? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> sister Sister? The, uh, Tia and With Tamara Murray. Tia and Tamara? I don't think I saw that. Yeah, they had a little brother who was like that little genius in, kid yeah, or something was, like that. I do yeah. remember that kid. Get him, Michael Jackson. My wife says we should get Macaulay Culkin. Don't you dare say a bad thing about Macaulay Culkin. <laughs> <laughs> She's defensive. <laughs> How would you do that, though? Like, that would be a lot of makeup to go from, like... CGI. Yeah, I guess so. Let's bring in Andy Circus and mocap this. The technology is Well, there. I think also something that we've learned from watching something that is like a whole life, that you don't do a whole life. You do the most interesting part yeah. or something exactly. that has not been explored and can make something interesting about it. Or if you're going to do chapters through the life, you have to make them complete chapters. Yeah. Okay. Michael Jackson, the movie. Start from The Wiz, meeting Quincy Jones, just cover the two albums they did together. Done. Why don't we just watch The Wiz again? Do that and call it quits. Okay, let's do that instead. Yeah, that'll be a lot cheaper. All right, <laughs> s- scrap the plans. <laughs> but seriously, let's just get Andy Serkis, just have him mocap Michael Jackson, because you know he'll get into it. Oh, yeah. I think he's the only person who could probably dance like Michael Jackson. <laughs> he'll touch a digital child. It, oh, my God. <laughs> you went there. <laughs> and we're moving on. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be like when he was playing King Kong and they just had this little puppet for him to hold. Oh my god. <laughs> Alleged guys. Alleged. Allegedly. Alleged. Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. <laughs> the alleged puppet. <laughs> and then we could also just have him play Corey Feldman so we don't have to actually bring Corey Feldman. Yeah, we don't want Corey Feldman anywhere near the set, especially craft services. <laughs> That's a movie in itself. Just make the entire movie about Corey Feldman's relationship with Michael Jackson. I would totally John make a Carpenter's movie. John Carpenter's Corey Feldman. Yeah. That would be incredible. <laughs> Just on the set of Friday the 13th, part four. Quick, someone get Michael Sarah on the phone. We need to film this. Michael yeah. Sarah, we need you to play Corey someone Feldman. Someone get Michael Sarah on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Just call his parents. They live in Brampton. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's the next town over from us. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, this is how far we're done talking about Elvis. <laughs> I think we're getting into anything, gold now. Anything else, guys? What'd you have for I dinner? I think we're desperate to talk about anything but Elvis at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's just nothing there. Nuts. So what kind of toppings are on the taco stand upstairs? Does it look good? Is there some fresh cilantro? <laughs> What's going on? Well, they have guacamole. That's what I'm talking Sold. about. Sold, yeah. <laughs> Got two kinds of cheese. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like mm-hmm. it. Right Hard here. and soft shells? Hard and soft shells, spicy yeah. meat, non-spicy meat. Whoa, yeah. well thought it. out, yes. <laughs> and several loaves of banana bread. Okay, now back off this crazy train before you get us all in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I believe someone also made rhubarb muffins. Rhubarb muffins, that sounds pretty good. Yeah, uh, That's a wild party. I think you should go be a chaperone for a second up there. <laughs> you somebody's I'm... breaking out the rhubarb muffins, come on. I know they were <laughs> cracking open bottles of Diet Coke up there. Whoa, <laughs> glass bottles? That could be dangerous. <laughs> So, yeah, I think we're done talking about Elvis. I'd like to add one more thing. I believe that they covered Elvis's incredible weight gain and obsession with bad food with one scene of him saying, more mayo, mama. <laughs> Sorry, when she made him that sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's like every time he shows up throughout the second half, he's holding a sandwich. Is he really? <laughs> yeah, because cool. he goes to the kitchen that one time and is talking to the grandmother and getting a sandwich. And he's talking to his wife and he's got a half-eaten sandwich. That's amazing. Suddenly, I'm just realizing this. There were a lot of sandwiches. Yeah, he had like, uh, I think he had like four plates of food in front of him at one point when he was yeah. talking to her at the dinner table. Oh, well, there you go. I stand corrected. It's a good way to get past the sensors. True. <laughs> See, John Carpenter has a skill for just suggesting things. Yes, the suggestion of peanut butter sandwiches. If only they had let him rewrite all the dialogue. Just the hint of fried peanut butter banana, and the audience will do the rest. It's true. And I love how they have one scene as a teenager, and from then on, we know how he combed his hair. Yeah, it was important for me to know that. So from then on, it's no longer a mystery. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, it's just, Elvis, I'm never going to probably watch this again. No, I don't need to see it ever again. My dad heard that I was watching this for this show, and he's like, oh yeah, bring it over this weekend, we can watch it again. I'll, I'll loan it to you. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm not touching that. <laughs> You'll take a few while to finish it. Trust me. Do it in six sittings. This is the kind of movie that my father-in-law will probably own on DVD and put on in the background like every single day for like three weeks and then never touch again. <laughs> I have a hard time even recommending it for like completists. I mean, you want to own this, just skip through it. I mean, just kind of like go through and just catch scenes here and there. But I really seriously think this is just going to bore the pants off of people. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that ends our discussion of Elvis. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. I think we're done here. It's a nice short suite. Then we just go off talking about insane things episode. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and that's okay, too. It's the way the good Lord intended it. That's right. Sadly, I'm, I'm a few days away from using the cold medicine excuse. That's okay. I'm right in the middle of that. And yet you're, you're the one who's still telling me when I've gone too far. <laughs> yes, but that's just like so ingrained that it's basically force a habit at this point. It's like subconscious. We're always just about to say, no, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> check yourself. <laughs> like I could be asleep and I'd be say, no, no, and it would be at the right time. I've at least gotten to the point now where I've, I don't go quite as far as I used to, <laughs> as consistently. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. We're older. We're wiser. Yeah. We're different people. Show me on the mocap suit where Michael Jackson touched you. Oh, my God. <laughs> and we're back. This ping pong ball. <laughs> Allegedly. Allegedly. <Yes. laughs> we're done with Elvis. Uh, next Forever. month. <laughs> next month, we have one last TV movie project because we had this whole series of four TV movies. Are we still in the 70s? 1979 still. Uh. <laughs> this is the last film of the 1970s. Wow. Before we go into the 80s. Is Better Late Than Never. I'm very excited about this So film. excited. I'm very excited. I'm oh, yeah. pumped up. Yeah. I think this is going to be a really, really good episode, too. This one, I just, I've intentionally not read what this one's about. I'm assuming you guys have. I got an idea. I got a whisper in my ear, and uh, I, 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 I'm speechless. It just seems like a really neat cast and a really not what you'd expect from something co-written by John Carpenter. Mm -hmm. And I'm very much looking forward. Better late than never. Don't wait to see the movie on your own before listening to the episode because it's not an easy movie to find. It's not really streaming anywhere online, not even illegally. It's not ever been officially released. I managed to find a bootleg somewhere. Nice. So I will admit to that. If it ever comes out on official release, I will purchase it. You'll make good. Yes. But we, I needed it for the purposes of this podcast. And with this, we will complete all of John Carpenter's films. Everything he's written and directed. That's incredible. This was the one thing we were missing. It's going to be the completest complete podcast that has ever been completed. Complete a Tron. I'm hoping for something at least on like just zoom up beach levels of something fun that we can just kick back and talk about and be surprised by. I have good feeling since the premise is so loose. I think we're going to have a lot to say because I don't know what we're going to say, which usually is good. And I need to find where I put my bootleg copy because I moved a couple of months ago and I'm not quite sure where it is. You have one month. The clock is ticking. I think I know the general area. <laughs> so if the podcast is delayed by a month or two, that, no, I'll find it. Anyways, I think that brings this episode to a close. Thank you for joining us, Kevin. Oh, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Sorry we couldn't start you off on a better foot. It's all right. Sorry I kept hacking and coughing all over you guys, which I guess is kind of my review of the movie in and of itself. It's fitting. And since that's all going to be edited out, the audience <laughs> is like, wait, he did what now? When? <laughs> I think it's just the sound of your body rejecting what you saw. It's true. It's an exorcism. That's probably it. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's probably exactly what it was. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> See, and that's the thing is, it wasn't even bad. It was just boring and flat. I'll take bad over boring any day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather it was bad. At least then it's interesting. I'm offended by how boring yeah. it was. Yeah. It was just playing it safe and didn't have any. Yeah. We've discussed it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm just going to like after the end credits of this episode, it's just going to be this whole montage of Kevin Coughs. Mm -hmm. I think that's good. <laughs> Can you intercut that with lines of boring dialogue from the movie? <laughs> <laughs> you should modulate it and auto-tune it to uh, an Elvis song. That'd be amazing. We all went into Elvis impressions right there. Blue moon See, I was thinking more like, <laughs> and then like the sound of Shelly Winters trying to get a line out while falling down. I'll oh, miss you, Jesse Gary. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I like the bit there where him and Red just are shoulder checking each other at the skating rink. Oh, yeah. What you doing? That what you're going to do? That's where you're going to go? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> You're like a brother to me, and I didn't get to see my brother get married. See, again, I want that movie. 
Yeah, I want that. Yeah, movie why too. didn't he let that guy come to his wedding? That was weird. I want Karate Elvis. I got two shots of Karate Elvis. I want a whole movie of that. <laughs> That's the movie I want is E in Red. Yeah, everyone just started calling him E all of a sudden. And then, like, Joe Montana just shows up. <laughs> Guys, where was Bagels? I was waiting for him the whole time, and I never saw him. Yeah, who was Ed Begley Jr. in that movie? Because he's in it. Oh, yeah, I saw him in the credits, and I didn't catch him either. I don't know. <laughs> I waited hours. No bagels. I'm upset. <laughs> I Googled it. I still couldn't find a picture Maybe of him. he went by him at one point. Because he wanted to go, like, hua, 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 <laughs> I looked up the character, and it was one of Elvis's drummers, so he must have been a drummer at some point. He just didn't have any lines or nothing? He just passed him by. <laughs> yeah, but it's like he's pretty prominently credited. Yeah, he's right in the beginning. Maybe that's because his name got bigger right after or something? Who knows? No, because he was pretty big by this, this point. The Spinal Tap version of this movie. <laughs> Let me see if I can find a picture of him. I got nothing. There's another reason to watch Elvis, a Where's Waldo approach to it. Fine yeah. bagels, fine <laughs> bagels. I did see the cameo of John Carpenter. He was in there? I didn't even see him. Did he have the mustache at that point? It was in the opening scene as Elvis was walking into the casino hotel. He passes a bar and John Carpenter's just sitting there at the bar. That's amazing. Are you sure that was a cameo and not just him just drinking away his sorrows while yeah. shooting the script? <laughs> Guys, like, just go without me. Uh, like fine. the assistant director calls cut. Shoot he's like, around me. <laughs> it was a well-composed shot, so I know it was him. Okay. But he could have just set it up. Yeah. yeah. Then he could go sit down. He doesn't have to watch it happen. It's true. Exactly. It's like, okay, this is where I'm going to be drinking over there. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, literally, he's just lighting up a smoke as Elvis walks by. That is the only shot of today. So, you know... We'll be doing this, and then we'll be uh, cutting and printing for about six hours, and then I'm going to go to bed, and then we're going to actually start working on the movie tomorrow. We can go throw some jacks over there, <laughs> and go talk to her, because she's giving me the eye. <laughs> Kurt, how are you? <laughs> I'm going to bed. You know, I got this great idea for uh, aliens. I don't know why I made him a Southern. Is he Southern Yosemite reason. Sam? I don't know. <laughs> no, don't stop. Don't stop. Yeah, I'll say, I'll say Kurt, I'll say Kurt, I'll say Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually know how he saw it. So, he talks he like that. Just anything. go with it. <laughs> <laughs> and then? Well, you see, this is when Michael Myers comes back, you hear? <laughs> <laughs> gonna go chase you all down the street, screaming like a maniac. <laughs> but don't worry, he's gonna learn how to drive a stick. He'll figure oh, it John out. John Carpenter's never gonna listen to our show. No, it's true. <laughs> well, he's probably not Southern anyway, so you know what, let's just go with it. No, he's not. Yeah. He's, he's <laughs> like... <laughs> We're making a movie. It doesn't have to completely fit. He's okay? from the Midwest suburbs. <laughs> I've got NyQuil. What's your excuse? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I know, Alex, you've been looking for like an opportunity to like start sneaking links to our show in the direction of John Carpenter. Don't start with this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm definitely not going to start with this one. Or maybe I should, because then he'll be like, this is the worst thing ever. I'm going to reblog it. <laughs> we, we, we should have done that when someone's watching me came out, because that was like our best episode ever. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, listeners who thought we raised the bar of discussion with someone's watching me, I'm sorry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you are in for an intelligent discussion this time, you get Yosemite Sam shooting Elvis. <laughs> Hopefully better late than never. And I was thinking in a few months we were going to have the first group not recommend, but now we got this one. No, nope. I'm a helper. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're our Kurt. It's true. For the next Kurt Russell, it's going to be a recommend, though. <laughs> so thank you for joining us, Kevin. Thank you for having me. Thank you again, Alex and Julia. I think we're done. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. It was lovely to meet you. Yes. I wish it was under better health circumstances. That's quite all right. We got Escape from New York coming up in a few months. All right. We'll go with that. I think we're done. That's a wrap. Okay, good, because I've, I have not been able to hold back any of those coughs. I'm so sorry. <laughs> don't <laughs> let worry about I it. I am so sorry. I'm serious. Oh, don't worry about it. We needed something interesting, because this miniseries sure wasn't. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Let I your body your reject and cleanse itself of the film that you watched, and rest in peace. <laughs> Damon's been gone. Damon's been gone. <laughs> your body is just editing its own outtakes. Yeah, there we go. Well, I think I better leave on that note. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved, and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com.
There was a small emoticon of pizza in in the contact thing. What was that? Did you enjoy it? Did you like it? I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> it, it was pizza it, for you, and then ghosts ate it. <laughs> it means pizza. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's a delicious you flavor circle. You don't need any deeper meaning than that. That is the deeper meaning. <laughs> I just really wanted to send you some pizza. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thank you. You're welcome. That'll go great with the tacos I just ate. Mmm, oh. taco. Michael lasted two weeks. Yeah, I had a cold like that not that long ago, and it was oh. rough. I didn't, because I'm the best. That's true. You kick colds to the curb. I do. We had a record-breaking sub-zero winter. It was I insane. got the entire thing no cold. I went down and I spent five days at a con in Chicago. No cold. I go to the local con for two hours, and I catch a cold. <laughs> it thawed like the thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was just a virus that had been laying there and waiting. Yep. 